Hi everyone, this is Melissa Keller, Director of Events and Project Management for Vineyard Worship. We release new music on the first Friday of every month. Vineyard Worship is truly a global family with over 2,400 churches worldwide. Familia, Vineyard Worship's latest monthly single is a perfect representation of this reality. Featuring Tina Colon Williams on vocals and produced by Grammy Award winner Dwan Hill, Familia is an organically bilingual, joyful celebration of the family of God. Let's come together and worship the Lord. The Find Familia and all of Vineyard Worship singles wherever you listen to music. There's a lot of surprise in creativity. We're surprised by things because I actually think that creativity and being creative might be the most kingdom thing we do because it's not this thing that you can kind of force or make happen. We're not planning our little eternal cities. I mean, we are actually trying to be surprised by whatever comes out of us or whatever comes out of life. That's why like, you have to let the ground lie fallow for a little bit, right? Like when you're writing with lay songwriters, you don't write year round. You write like for a season and then you let them live life for a little bit because I actually think creativity is not really doing, it's more being. So you are a person and out of the person that you are, the thing comes forth. It's just like the kingdom to me. The Ferment. You're listening to The Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. This is another edition in our conversation series. Today's guests are well-known recording artist John Mark McMillan and Pastor Ted Kim from the Vineyard in Evanston, Illinois. What's up, everybody? Adam here. You are listening to the Ferment Podcast. And today, I don't have one guest. I have two. Two good friends. Ted Ken from Chicago. High five. High fives. Boom. And John Mark McMillan in Charlotte, North Carolina. High fives. Boom. Boom. Five. Boom. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked because sometimes the text threads move to podcasts. <laughs> And that doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it does. And that's what's going on here today. So if you're wondering, like, what is going on in this podcast or what is the conceit? Well, I'll just set it up by saying this. John Mark and Ted and I, we had a text thread going the other day. And we were talking about, somehow we got to talk about wasting time. And what we do to sort of like like kill time or waste time and you know just that 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 space where if your time is not absolutely taken with something what are the place where are the places you go or what are the things you like to do and um what was funny is that you guys texted me lists <laughs> you guys texted me lists and they were like ranked ranked ordered lists it was funny <laughs> Uh, and then we then we somehow from that ended up talking about creative process. And what's funny about that is I think these are actually very connected. But I think first what I want to do is say, hey, welcome to the podcast. And then I also want to say, why don't we talk about your wasting time lists for a moment? <laughs> Ted, you want to go first? Man, I, yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> I spend, okay, so the number one thing on my list is I watch YouTube reviews of backpacks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
man, I got a backpack. I like my backpack. I don't need a new backpack, but I still watch these (laughs) reviews of backpacks. I mean, there's this guy on, on YouTube who reviews backpacks and I'm just in it for this guy. And these are like, these are not like three minutes of, this is a pretty good backpack. Put your books in here. Here's where your laptop goes. I mean, these are like 20 to 50 minutes long. You know, Amazing. sometimes he does these like huge ones where he's like 50 bags in 50 minutes. And I'm, I watched the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings up like a ton of questions or <laughs> observations, I guess, on my end. One would be number one, there's an audience for anything. That's right. Right. Like whatever you're into. But then uh, number two, I guess I just want to dive in here a bit, Ted. Why are you so into backpacks? You have a back. You just said you have a backpack. Why are you still wanting to watch it? What is the, what's the itch that's being scratched? Well, okay. So, uh, in, I guess in conjunction with the backpack thing, I've just started realizing that I don't have very much intention when it comes to my life is especially when it relates to clothing. Okay. So I, at, at some point I got to this real, I came to this realization that, um, I'm mostly sort of broken when it comes to thinking about the way that I appear to people. <laughs> and I mean, I'm seriously, I think about that all the time. Like I, I got no hair on the top of my head and I'm like, I, I got to present some other way. And so I really started thinking about like, what, what do I like tell people about myself when with my clothes, you know? And, um, I just started noticing that I would buy things all the time, just like buy random stuff all the time. And I'd buy like t-shirts of people that I really like, you know, I got like two John Mark (laughs) t-shirts. I got a bunch of Andy Squire t-shirts, you know, like I just started buying stuff. And then I realized when I went on a trip, one, I went on this trip to, to Istanbul last year to Turkey, which is like a really cool place. And I realized everything most of the things I own aren't really super functional. They don't really like match. They don't really like, they're not really like, like I can only wear them once. I just pit them out and I'm like, I can't use this again. It smells terrible, whatever. And I just started thinking like, what about my clothing? And what is it? What do I actually care about with my clothing? And so then I started thinking about like, well, how would I, if I were to actually go somewhere and, and live like just for two or three weeks, what would I take with me? And I realized I didn't know what I would take with me. And so I started thinking, and then I got backwards into the backpack thing. And I started thinking about backpacks. And then I started thinking about capsule wardrobes, which is basically just a few small items that you wear every season. I started thinking about uniforms. I started thinking about ethically made clothing. I started thinking about all this other stuff. But really, I kind of like stuff, you know? And I want to have like a couple different backpacks. I want a little sling for my stuff when I go, I want to have a gym bag, but I also want to have a travel bag. And in that travel bag, I want to have things that I feel like I can, I can wear and not really think about. A lot of my clothing is kind of uncomfortable. Like I'm sad to say, I tried to do the raw denim thing and Adam, man, you look super dope with raw denim. I totally understand it. I tried doing it, but I don't know if it's just my like, like just kind of chunky, like Asian shape or whatever, but it's just, it always just don't work for me. I don't know. I mean, like this Japanese salvage. So I'm thinking this stuff should work. I mean, it's made by Japanese people, but it just doesn't work for me. So I started like thinking, well, I like the idea of that though, wearing the same pair of jeans over and over and over again, kind of living into them and then making the thing your own. And I thought, is there another way I can do that? So I started doing research and then I found my way into backpack way too long about backpacks. <laughs> but anyway, I love it's it. Just, that's just where I end up. There's like the top two things I think about. Clothes, like clothes and backpacks. And, and, well, and ethically made clothing that I can wear over and over and over again. Like I just want two pairs of pants, you know? Yeah. That's it. I get that. Well, but one of, one of the things I like about what you're sharing here, Ted, is, um, or at least what I'm hearing is, and I hate to make this about the sexes right up front, but I will. Th- there's just something inside of men. We love gear. So when I hear you talking about backpacks, like we do. in general, in general, dudes just like, you know, 
whatever the gear is. Like music, half of being a musician is guitars, pedals, amps, and recording stuff. Like I mean, that's just Preach. half of it. It's our that's fascination right. with plugging things in and making things work. And 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 I think backpacks kind of go into that same category. Backpacks, pens. I like pens too. I like fountain pens. I like machine pens. I like notebooks. I mean, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> I like it all. I believe it. I believe it. That's one of the things I've come to know about you. All right, JM. Uh, what was on your wasting time list? What was number one? The first thing on my wasting time list was um, I like to build swimming pools on Minecraft. You like to build swimming my pools kids. on Minecraft. Swimming pools on Minecraft. I don't know. Like I was out of the video game world for a while, but now I have, you know, two um, young boys. And so I wasn't really aware of Minecraft for a long time. So they're, they're on Minecraft and they like to do this like creative mode where you create the world that you're in. And so I'll sit down and do that with them because it's actually really relaxed, you know, just sort of making stuff. And um, I got to where... I would, I would build a house and I'm like, well, I'm done with this. What does it need? I'm like, it needs a pool, right? So I'd build a pool, you know, and um, I started coming up with all these different kinds of pools. I built pools with glass walls that had like um, turtles and starfish and stuff in the side of the pool. I built pools underwater, like in lakes, down at the bottom of lakes. Then you have a pool and you swim and then there's a connection. You swim into the lake from the pool. We're talking hours of meaningless create creation. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Absolutely meaningless. And I love it so much. Yeah, Swimming it's pools. So good. Oh, also hot tubs. You can put lava. The boys, my boys showed me you can put lava at the bottom of the pool and it'll make it bubble so it's you know, a heated pool. Minecraft. Man. Pools on Minecraft. Okay, so how old are your boys, JM? They are nine and twelve. Okay, so this is like this is high end nine and 12 year old boy stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm interested in this beyond just the, the thought picture of you sitting with your boys on the couch, like making things on Minecraft, which is a really sweet picture. <laughs> I'm just also wondering about this. I wonder what stays alive in us. You know, you're not a young guy anymore. You're in yeah, your, yeah, you're, totally. you're, you're 40, right? I'm 40. Yeah, you're 40. So you've crossed over now, but there's something <laughs> there's something that stayed alive in you that connects with yeah, your kids totally. at that at that basic level. And I hear it in your voice like it's actual joy. Oh yeah, I love it. I mean, I think part of it as a side note, it has been such a hot, miserable summer. Like, this has got to be the most miserable summer of my life, right? which is terrible because like I actually have a pretty good, <laughs> but you know, like it's hot and all my kids want to do is like watch TV or screens or YouTube videos. And, uh, and so I wonder, like I'm sitting there miserable and I'm building swimming pools. I think subconsciously I'm like, if we only had a pool, <laughs> you know, it's like 98 degrees, you know, and I'm like, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. The gyms are closed. The malls are closed. Everything is closed. The outdoors are closed because it's a hundred degrees in the South, you know? And so all you have, you know, so subconsciously, I think I'm just dreaming of a pool, but I think the thing is, and this is what I love about having kids. Uh, this is obviously not a visual podcast, but you see the comic books on my back wall. Yeah. Like kids give us this um, permission to enjoy things that we may have at some point decided were not available to us. You know, like my nine-year-old plays baseball and it is just absolutely so much fun watching him go out. He's batting a thousand this season, by the way, Like he hasn't struck out once the whole season, but it's so much fun. I haven't thought about baseball in, you know, 30 years, you know, and all of a sudden my son's playing baseball and I'm all about it. My kids are reading comic books. I'm all about it. It's like somewhere I decided that that stuff wasn't helpful for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, your kids come around. You're like, "I really love this. Gosh, why did I ever stop? Why did I ever stop loving the things I love? Was it because I thought it was going to make me unattractive to people I thought were important? Probably, if you really want to dig into the psychology. But, but like, 
I I love how kids do that. I love how they give you permission to love the things that you love and remind you of things that you actually love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and something you just said that reminded me of something I read maybe a month ago. I was reading, I mean, it wasn't like a scientific journal. It was an article that was quoting some scientific journals, but basically what the article was saying is that one of the number one ways that children learn is by playing. And that basically the dumbest thing that adults can ever do is to stop playing. Like, oh, like yeah. even our even our adult development uh, can continue in very in very similar ways if we if we keep this sense of play in our life in some way. Well, I mean that goes back to the time wasting conversation, right? Yeah, there's so many things that people think are a waste of time that are actually highly beneficial. And this is why I have a big problem with people call music entertainment, you know, and the entertainment industry is like music falls under the entertainment industry. I want to get up and walk out of the room when people talk about it like that. Or when people call, you know, content. I hate the word content. Gary so Vee. Make... Shout out Gary Vee. You know, <laughs> I like Gary Vee, but I hate content, you know. Yeah. But it's like, you know, like it's not, it's not entertainment. Like this is the way we, this is part of active living right this yeah. is part of sharing and taking part in other people's stories you know it's not entertainment i mean wasting yeah. time isn't always wasting time right no and that, i think that was one of the things that kind of came through on the text thread the other day ted's writing out you know i like to watch backpack <laughs> reviews john mark is right now you're sitting in front of a wall filled with comic books <laughs> and you like to do Minecraft with your kids. But one of the things that, that came through was as we were just kind of like being silly, all of a sudden the conversation on the text thread, it very organically turned towards this other subject, which was basically that, that oftentimes creative breakthrough comes from giving yourself this, this, this squishy space that we sometimes might you know, non-critically call wasting time, but it's almost like it's a, it's a door through the back of the wardrobe into this other place, if I could use that image. Mm. And so yeah. I, I would just love for both of you to riff there for a moment, uh, if you want to, about how, you know, having a little bit of space where maybe you're just sitting on the couch with your kids doing Minecraft, or maybe you're cruising through YouTube, but it's actually opening up another door. Mm. I have some thoughts, but I don't want to talk over Ted. I've been talking for a minute. No, go for it. John Mark, go, man. Go. Okay. So I feel like I learned, and by the way, there are a lot of ways to be creative, you know, especially in songwriting. Any any way you get there is the right way. Right? You know, there's no real right way to get there, but at least what I've learned, um, in the, you know, my 25 years of writing music is that um, it's not always a linear path, right? It's not always one plus one equals two. Because as a songwriter, probably the, the thing that you are trying to do the most, right, or the, the goal, really, because I mean, I can sit down and rewrite a song. I can rewrite one of your songs. You know what I mean? Um, but but at the end of the day, is you know what I'm saying? Like that song already exists in the world. So a big challenge for me is to come up with new ideas, right? And you have to figure out a way for those new ideas to enter into your thinking. And if you do all the same stuff all the time, you're thinking about the same stuff all the time. You're seeing the same people all the time. You're using the same words all the time. Then, you know you don't always have opportunity to think those new thoughts. The problem is new thoughts are often very silly, right? They're very silly by nature. If it's new to you, it's going to be odd, hmm. right? That's great. So you have to make place in your life for the odd, the silly and the weird sometimes, you know? And so for me, it's like, I have to give my mind a break and give it opportunity to breathe a little bit sometimes before those, um, ideas you know start to come and i've noticed um when i work too hard for too long um a lot of times i burn out you know um and and i have to go out and do things that are not 
remotely connected to songwriting. Because at the end of the day, songwriting is not about songwriting. No one wants to hear a song about a song. You know what I mean? No one wants to hear, you know, no one wants to see a documentary on documentaries, right? Like what we want from a song and a documentary and a painting is we want to feel connected to life. So you kind of have to go out and live some life in order for those new thoughts um, to kind of start firing. At least that's what I've discovered in my experience. You know, the creativity isn't a thing that can be forced. It's got to be a thing that's discovered. And in order to discover it, your eyes have to be, um, uh, gosh, you, you can't be overburdened with the familiar, right? Yeah. It's like you, you have to be free to see it. You know how like when you're really busy, you don't see anything? Like, you know, it's the difference in driving. Have you ever, like I used to drive to work, you know, or drive to the store. I started riding my bike and I see so much more. Right. And I'm wasting time. I'm wasting a lot of time by riding my bike because it takes me four times, six times as long to get there and back. I can carry, I can't carry as much, but I'm seeing houses that I didn't know were there, you know, streets. And then I'm actually smelling things, you know, I'm seeing down streets because you're driving, you're not looking down the street. I feel in the bumps on the pavement. Like I'm experiencing more of life. So I guess that's what I'm saying is sometimes the, what do you call it when you're highly productive? You get things done fast. What do you call that in business? Like efficiency. Efficiency. Sometimes efficiency is the enemy of creativity. 100%. Because you have to be inefficient sometimes. You have to slow down sometimes to actually experience the thing that you're going to eventually channel into your uh, expression. Yeah, I love that. In fact, I think, Ted, I think on our text thread, you even mentioned something very, very similar, didn't you? You said creativity is not the same as productivity. I, I want to say that's, that's right. what you said. Yeah. You want to you want to just pick up where John Mark is leaving well, off there? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think creativity is productivity <laughs> because I think that we oftentimes plan to be productive, you know, and I actually think there's a lot of surprise in creativity. Mm. We're surprised by things because I actually think that creativity and being creative might be the most kingdom thing we do uh, because it's not this thing that you can kind of force or make happen. It's not like we're not urban planning our little, our little eternal cities. I mean, we are actually trying to be surprised by whatever comes out of us or whatever comes out of life. That's why like you have to let the ground lie fallow for a little bit, right? Like when you're writing with lay songwriters, you don't, write year round you write like for a season and then you let them live life for a little bit because i actually think creativity is not really doing it's more being mm -hmm. so you are a person and out of the person that you are the thing comes forth it's just like the kingdom to me yeah. you know i mean the kingdom is all about ways of being i mean when we're doing things and we're not being and those things aren't in harmony that's what we call a pharisee mm -hmm. actually and so and then also to your point about, about children, children, creativity. I'm watching my kids create all the time. And I also think that, that that play is kingdom. And maybe that's what the invitation to to inherit or enter the kingdom like a child actually means. Um, that all these things that we thought were time wasters, you know, yeah. um, become actually distinctively imbued kingdom activity. Yeah. You know, um, what's more kingdom act, what's more kingdom than actually me being with my children yeah. and me actually saying, we don't actually have an agenda. Usually when I have an agenda for my kids, they hate it. <laughs> they hate it. <laughs> They're like, Hey, I got an agenda for you. We got lots of fun planned for today. They're like, no, uh, -uh. Yeah. but it's like when we go step out on the sidewalk and say, Hey, let's just see where the road takes us. And I know that doesn't include their every Enneagram type. But at least for us, the surprise in the journey is kind of kind of the the deal, you know. Um, I have like a founding pastor named Steve Nicholson, and he talks about the kingdom is both the promise of the government resting on Jesus' shoulders, and it's the surprise of all the little ways that the kingdom of God breaks in.
What up songwriters? Adam here. I want to tell you something that's coming up in November. November 8 and 11, and then also on 16 and 18, we are hosting a virtual edition of Song Lab. That is a Monday and Wednesday on two consecutive weeks. Four sessions total. These sessions will be inspirational, they will be instructive, and they will be geared towards actually writing. We're gonna make space for you to co-write with others in long writing blocks so that after these sessions are finished, everyone will have written on at least three different songs. We will be joined by Dee Wilson from Common Hymnal, and then also Leslie Jordan, and maybe you know Leslie from her days in All Sons and Daughters. And we'll also be joined by several of our very best Vineyard Worship friends. So if you're wanting to write, if you're wanting to grow, if you're wanting to refine your craft, this is the event for you. Sign up at vineyardworship.com. One of the things that John Mark said a moment ago, it reminded me of a, an experience that Ted and I had. Uh, you were talking about how it's different to ride your bike to work than it is to drive to work. Yeah. And uh, when you said that, it reminded me of, it, it would have been last year, Ted and I, we met with some other songwriters in New York City. You know, we just, we flew some of our friends around and we all met in Hell's Kitchen and we stayed for four or five days and we wrote songs together. And what's interesting is, is that the environment was as much a part of the process as almost any other thing, because clearly I'm from rural Kentucky and Ted is an urbanite, uh, but still New York City is its own thing. And then here we all came, you know, California and different places. And there was something about that New York energy. Uh, we're together, we're all in a place where everything is kind of new. And so it kind of flips mm -hmm. your brain from I know this to I'm discovering this. Yeah. And when mm -hmm. we and I just noticed for me, like having a week of I'm discovering this, it made songs just happen. And we just we just wrote songs all day, every day. And it wasn't even a thing. Yeah. It was just like it was like the environment was flipping switches inside of us, if that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Totally. It's like when I went to Japan, I, I I got so many ideas, but I'm not writing songs about Japan necessarily. Yeah. It's just, I'm seeing new things because well, in Japan, they're just people like me. It's just because they live different and look different. All of a sudden I see people a different way and I love it. I have an epiphany. I was, I've been watching Annie Clark's masterclass on songwriting. She's the, you know, she's St. Vincent. She's written with Sufia and then Jack Antonoff and, all of my favorite pop and indie writers, like all of them, whether you like her or not, like she's insanely creative. And she says that every song has to have an epiphany, right? Yeah. Every song has to have an epiphany. So how do you have epiphanies if you know where you're going? Mm. You know, how do you have epiphanies if you know where you're going? You kind of have to get lost and work your way out a little bit. I mean, David Byrne talks about in his book, it's my favorite book on music. It's called The Way Music Works. I just bought it again because I gave it away a few years ago and I was kind of dying to have it on my desk. But he talks about how music is not this thing that is inside of us that works its way out. It says, music, music is actually drawn out of us from the environment. So it's actually, the, the music is in the environment. The music actually isn't in you. Or maybe to be more mm. specific, the music is the way you respond to the world around you. And so you see music, the very sound of music change over, the, over time based on the venue. And he has a whole list of how music, classical music changed as the venues got bigger and smaller. Jazz changed as venues got a bit bigger and smaller. You hear this in church music a lot, especially because everyone is imagining they're in a stadium. So even in small churches, everyone has decided that stadium worship is what worship sounds like. But, you know, the reason stadium worship is only four chords is because you can't play dissonant chords in a large room because the tails get too long, gets muddy. I mean, you could still do it, but what sounds way better is 
burn a chord hello cleveland you know what i'm saying it's yep. like <laughs> one chord two chords it just feels great in a big room and, but it's the environment that draws this out of us you know so it's like having those experiences is is just as much part of writing you know being in new york being in a new place and that's one beautiful thing about new york is there's so much to pull on you know there's so many threads you can just like wander or or unravel i guess you know well yeah and what you're saying there is is reminding me of this other thing that ted and i were talking about the other day we were talking about how closely connected surprise and transcendence are yeah. john mark you were you were just saying you were saying how saint vincent said that every song has to have an epiphany yeah which is which is basically saying that if it's a good song and you know this is i'm assuming some things here but like a good song is tapping us into the transcendent yeah it's it's somehow connecting us to our heartache for more yeah but in order for the song to do that there has to be some sort of a an epiphany in there which is some sort of a revelation some sort of a surprise and mm. and Ted and I were talking about how often transcendence and surprise are so deeply connected and so Ted I don't know if you want to if you want to share any more about that no, I, 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 I would love to hear I would love to hear John Mark and you riff on surprise and tr transcendence because the thing that I think of is Philip on the road uh, and then he gets like lifted off of the road and then all of a sudden he's like teleported to this Ethiopian eunuch and then the guy gets baptized the guy's reading Isaiah and then he gets lifted off and 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 I just wonder about Philip like was he surprised I think he's pretty, probably pretty surprised. Uh, but if you look at the book of Acts, it's just a series of surprises over and over and over again. Pentecost. I mean, you are you can't plan Pentecost. You just don't. Okay, at this point, the tongues of fire are going to come down. Yeah. And then, you know, like about 23 minutes in our planning center call sheet. We're going to run sheet, <laughs> 23 minutes. That's when, when everybody, all the foreigners come in and then they go, what's happening here? And then 33 minutes, just so you know, Peter's going to stand up and talk. So everybody's got to get a little, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's how, that's how we become awake to the kingdom and how the kingdom breaks in. It's surprise. Yeah. And you know, that makes me wonder here though. You're right. We, we don't get to plan Pentecost. We don't get to plan or orchestrate everything, but we do get to arrange our lives so that we can be open to this. Right. That's right. We can we can yeah. we can say you know what yeah. the universe seems to have these patterns or these laws deeply built into it. Uh, Ted, a few moments ago on, when you were talking, you were talking about letting the ground lay fallow. You know, even farmers know that if you just keep farming the same piece of ground, you get diminishing returns. John Mark was saying, you were saying if you just keep writing, you know, you you eventually. You know, if you're just writing songs all the time, you you you, you run into a brick wall. Like you actually mm -hmm. have to go do the thing that doesn't seem like it's songwriting, but it's deeply connected. It's 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 letting the ground lay fallow. Uh, yes, there's this thing called transcendence, and you don't get to have like complete control over it. But at the same time, we do get to arrange our lives so that we could be open to it. Hmm. That's right. I think the creative habit is actually habituated openness. To epiphany. Mm. Mm. So, okay. Man, That's what I, I think it is. Man, I've been having these kind of thoughts lately, right? You talk about transcendence and surprise. You know, we're talking about the unknown, right? The transcendence. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but transcendence means sort of the thing that's beyond us or the thing beyond what we fully have capacity to intellectually um, hold in our minds. Is that correct? Transcendence. We, and also beyond, you know, I, and also beyond the imminent, the material, what we can see, yes. feel, and touch. Yeah. Exactly, beyond the material. And you think about Abraham, the father of the three major Western faiths, right? Abraham, and what is he, the father of? Is it the father of faith? Right? We say he's the father of faith, but when we when we look at the defining characteristic of Abraham's life, or the moment that defines him is the moment he left what he knew when he stepped into the unknown, right? Immediately stepped into the unknown. I was thinking this the other day about 
how people got to Hawaii. And I think I read that they got to Hawaii on canoes. And if you know how far away Hawaii is from the United States, it's the I've most isolated landmass in the world. And and people got there before we had sailboats, before we had helicopters. I mean, people were there, right? And people got there. Okay. So that means that at least two people, because one person can't make a baby, at least two people were in a canoe or some sort of boat. I would love to read up about this. I bet the technology is actually cooler than I'm giving it credit for. But, you know, that means human beings got in a boat on the shore somewhere and they didn't get out of that boat for a long time. Months, you know, and how do you hit that little island? Okay, so, and then I was thinking that there's like, people just aren't like that anymore. I was like, well, that's not entirely true. You know, like my Irish ancestors, you know, they they took the, I'm Scotch Irish, but you know, we, we left and we took a, a boat to the new world. We had no idea what was going to be there. Three months on the water, you're throwing up. You know what I mean? A bunch of weird, stinky people for months. And, you know, and, and then when you get there, what are you going to do? You're going to turn around and go back. If it doesn't work, I'll know you're there. That's you. And then the people who cross the United States, you think about, you know, why would people do this? You know, like, I don't want to be whatever, but my kids are reading this book about pioneers and has a little list about how they died and what happened to them. There's this little C in my, and Moses, who's nice, says, see, dad, that C means they were cannibalized. <laughs> you know, they were starving to death, so they ate each other, right? Why were people willing to do this? Like, what is in people? And, and I thought, th- they don't make people like that anymore. But then I realized, like, we strap missiles to our bodies and explode ourselves into outer space. And we're talking about going to Mars. I'm like, we are obsessed with the unknown. I think that's fundamentally what it means to be a person. Hmm. We're obsessed with the unknown. And to me, like, and, and I think we're obsessed with the unknown because we are absolutely drawn to the transcendent. And something about pushing out beyond what we know materially is just part of who we are. Clearly. And so the surprise is that thing that says it was worth it. The surprise is that thing that says, like, um, do it again, right? The surprise is that thing that says, I promise there's more out there for you. Because you didn't know this was going to happen, and it did. That means that maybe other things that are beyond you are also capable of happening. And that's what I hear in music. When I don't know the next chord is coming. Or when I do know and it surprises me anyway. You know? But this is the story we're telling in music, I think, is, is the story of the order and chaos, the known and the unknown. That's what faith is, the willingness to push out beyond what we know materially. And that's what we do in music. Because I walk into a room, I did this last night. I've been doing this the last four or five nights. I go out in my garage after my kids are asleep with nothing but a guitar. And when I walk in, you know, at 12.31 in the morning, I wake up the next day and I have a song that did not exist the night before. It's surprise. Yeah. Mm. Why? How does that happen? I love it. You know, and why do I love it so much? I don't know. Well, John Mark, your your riff there is reminding me of an experience I had. Gosh, I think this is this experience is probably six or seven years old. And I think both of you know it, but I've never I don't think I've ever told it on the podcast. Um, I don't normally have dreams. My wife is the dreamer, and I maybe have one dream a year that I can remember. And Probably seven years ago, I had this dream, and in the dream, a, 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 a like a, a pretty short man walks out of the woods straight up to me, and just you know how you know things in dreams, but you don't you don't know why you know them. I know that this in the dream, I know that this man is Daniel Boone, which is hilarious, mm-hmm. and he looks me straight in the eye and he says, "Adam, you need to go. You need to go back into the woods. Go back to the forest because the frontier is still alive." And then he wow. turned around and he walked back into the woods. And that was the end of the dream. I woke up and it was so vivid, real that I, I just couldn't shake it. And at the beginning, I just thought that was a weird dream. But like four days later, I realized, I think this is some kind of a God haunted dream. And I started to think, oh, maybe, maybe there's something here for me, A, to to give myself permission to explore 
whatever that is, you know, whatever I'm interested in, whatever is enchanted, whatever seems to have uh, breadcrumbs on the trail. But then I also started to realize how many men in particular, and, and I'm sure women too, but I just know how many men are like, living lives of like quiet desperation and mm. like actually depressed because mm-hmm. like there's where else do we go now right like except except Jeff Bezos and his billions or Elon Musk and his billions who gets to strap a rocket on and even have a chance to go to Mars right like John Mark the story you were telling earlier about your ancestors uh that was a moment when the frontier was not only alive but it was open to people you could just mm. go or you could be a radical like the moravians and you know put all of your possessions into a pine box that would be your grave sell yourself into slavery and you know go to the go to the frontier but now where do you go mm. and and i think that's one of the fundamental questions of our age is where does a man go now mm. man Such a huge, huge question. That's actually <sighs> such a really, really good question. Because aren't we just kind of talking about creativity being hitched to wayfaring in a way? So like are aren't we actually just talking about I mean the 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 truth that I mean I think that we're all going somewhere. Our lives are pointed towards something. Mm, yeah. And I think yeah. that's a set sad thing about our about our i think about the cultural moment that we live in is that the material is more real than the insubstantial or the Mm. material is more real than that that dream that you had you know like you just think like five or six hundred years ago somebody wakes up with that dream and and they're like not you know that that dream is the substance of reality for them but right now, the substance of reality for us is, you know, like that which that that which we can see, feel, and touch, you know. And so, I think inborn in the hope of creativity, being an activity which, whatever it is, it springs out of us as a response to that which is around us, which again speaks back to what are we actually responding to in our, our in environment in our environment, like what's actually happening in New York City. Is it the energy of New York City or is it something else? Is it the fact that every single one of these autonomous beings actually hangs their existence on something that's beyond them? Mm. And is that what we're actually tapping into? And is that the thing that's actually more real than the thing that we like put our feet on and pick up with our hands? That's the thing that I've been thinking about. And I feel like creativity is the exit into that other kind of reality which is way more substantial and real than the thing that we live with it's like in the great divorce when when all the people come up and visit heaven and george mcdonald's is standing there and they're trying to walk on the grass and all of the blades of grass just poke their feet and give them pain because it's actually more real up there than it was down below and i think that creativity is the way that we like exit from some of these stories that actually aren't very helpful uh, mm-hmm. And so that they're, they're, they are guideposts uh, in the very best possible sense to helping us understand reality in the way that it's, it's supposed to be understood, right? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, like every single one of these music and art and humanity pieces, I mean, they're the reason why people exit from their atheism. It's not like reading like a logician's technical handbook on why their atheism actually doesn't make any sense it's when their imagination actually gets captured by something that's beautiful that actually carries within it greetings from beyond right Mm -hmm. and so that's the thing we're doing with our songs and so i just think that the habituated openness means we'll make it a habit and a pattern in our lives to create space in our lives where we can be open for the epiphany i mean like when we were writing in new york city we're not like You didn't say there was no missive from you, Adam, as we sat around the table saying we need seven songs or this, you know, guys. (laughs) Could you imagine if I had done that? Could you imagine? Yeah, we spent a lot of money here. We're in New York City. It's not cheap. I mean, 
you know, we're going to eat some great <laughs> food and, and blah, blah, blah. And you better give us seven songs. I mean, like, uh, you know, you're all talented. So we're going to squeeze it out of you. You know, we're going to instrumentalize all of your gifting so that we can, you know, because whatever you did not do that. What did you did was you created space, habituated openness for the epiphany. And you didn't say at the end of like, I hope that this will be worth it because we'll get three or four songs. It'll be singles and there'll be hits and everybody will sing. them. You didn't even say that. You just said, we're gathering here together to be open. Uh, and hopefully these songs will be like, will be like wayfarers that kind of like point us to our North star. Right. And that's all you really did. And even sometimes at 2 PM, you were like, Hey, I'm kind of tired. Should we go get ramen? So we did. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And you know what? It actually helps. That actually helps. Ramen helps. <laughs> How it does. Well, I think something you were saying, Ted, that like uh, just a second ago that kind of like set me off was, you know, like um, this idea that the material, the material can't, it's not that material is bad and immaterial is good. It's just that the material, in my opinion, doesn't work without the immaterial. It becomes Man. the documentary about the documentary that nobody wants to see. It's the song about the song that nobody wants to see. It's rock band singing songs about tour buses and stadiums. Nobody cares. No one cares. It's like, you know, unless you're Stephen King. Now, his book on writing was awesome because it wasn't about writing. <laughs> you know what I mean? His book on writing was awesome because it wasn't about writing. But nobody wants a song about songwriting. They want a song about something else. And I think it's the material doesn't exist for itself. And when the material world begins to exist for itself, it collapses. Right. You know, like I have this idea that facts aren't real. Like facts are not real because the fact outside of a story is a stagnant reality. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but until that fact is part of your story, it practically doesn't exist. Right. And so the story is that part of you that, um, you know, that <laughs> exists for something more than existing. Yeah, well, and that's what human beings do is we tell stories. And yeah. stories are a way of organizing what might look on the surface at, either as a random set of facts or so many facts that they can't be processed by our you know, our limited capacities. And so we, we find the pieces that seem to have the most meaning and we arrange them in such a way that we could understand something about life. Right. So I think that's, I, I, I think that's where I resonate with what you're saying there, because that's what, that's what human beings are. We're, we're meaning making creatures and, and out of that we're story making creatures and the facts have to align themselves ultimately under those much bigger narrative devices. Right. And yeah. we do all that work with our friends. <laughs> yeah. We do not do that work on our own. Yeah. The meaning making happens with significant other people. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we can just like come up with our own. Uh, we have to have conversation with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Synthesis happens. Meaning happens around the dinner table. You know, um, the thing that you're talking about, John Mark, and you're talking about Adam feels so hopeful to me because it's communal. Yeah. Story making does not happen on your own. Mm -hmm. You inherit it and you synthesize it and you work it out with your family and your friends. Mm -hmm. And dare I say, part of what happened in New York City is friendship. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, and even to what you're saying right now, Ted, in terms of like the communal nature of storytelling, the, a story, a story assumes uh, there's the storyteller or the story crafter. You know, the story itself has to have someone who's like crafting the story or adding to the story or editing to the story. But it assumes a telling, doesn't it? And the it telling does. assumes an audience, and that audience actually is a participant in whatever it is that we're doing. Right. Art is not. I mean, this is the problem. I mean, like I grew up. So, I mean, this is sort of my story, but I grew up, uh, I mean, this is so tropish, but I mean, like I grew up, I grew up doing math and playing violin <laughs> and memorizing vocab words. I'm serious. That was my upbringing. Like I had to memorize like two or three words before I went to school, you know, um, I'm like 
reading Herman Melville, I mean, like the, at least like I told my parents I did, but I actually did. I just read the first chapter and the last chapter of Moby Dick. Okay, look, I get it. Whale wins. And what is the whale? You know, who knows? Global American capitalism, whatever, whatever it is. It's a prophetic book for our times. I mean, it really is. Melville is prophetic book for, but anyway, I just remember reading. I think that the death of classical music is that it stopped being attentive to that reality that you just said, Adam. Mm. I think the death of classical music began when it started to become avant-garde and nobody could listen to it. Because mm. I played all these pieces growing up. I mean, I listened to classical music almost exclusively until I went to high school. And then we had to do a lip sync contest and I'm like, I am screwed. Nothing I listen to has people sticking to it except for maybe like a Beethoven chorale or something. And I don't speak German, right? So I had to start listening to like music and and differently. But but when we started playing modern music, everything, you know, like early 1900s and whatever, it was impenetrable. You know, it was like they forgot. Well, you have an audience. Whereas like Mozart and all of these like early composers were living and dying on the way the piece was received, you know, in the mm-hmm. hall. Mm-hmm. I mean, like creativity is, that's the thing. It's not. It's it's communal and and we're sharpened actually too. I mean, through the friendship, what does the friendship create space for? Well, it creates space for actually Adam saying to me, Well, what about that line? And what about this line? And I mean, there's there there's participation together. So it's not just I bring something to you, there's co-creation that actually happens, you know, in spaces like that as it's founded on friendship. I just want to go back to something you said maybe two segments earlier, Ted, when you were talking about creativity. I I want to say this is what you were talking about. You were talking about creativity bringing greetings from beyond. You used that little phrase, which is peculiar and kind of wonderful, you know? Uh, And I think what you were talking about in that section was about how the hard material world, it can't be the only world, right? There's something that that sits from beyond Um, in some of the theological, theological literature, they'll talk about elsewhere. I don't know if you guys have ever written, read about elsewhere. I love this idea, you know, like that there's something in the kingdom of heaven and we get glimpses of it. And it's when we, when we bring it into the here and now it's, it's like a story or a word or a, or a piece from elsewhere. And so I just wonder if you would, if you would maybe, Share with us a little bit more about that because we're living in a world where like the hard material world keeps pressing people almost into hopelessness. I hate to be so bleak, but but there there needs to be this sense of like there's another world that's breaking in. Well, 
but okay. And so, so I'll just drop a book recommendation. Uh, it's a small little book called on beauty and being just. And one of the things that I like really like to do with my time is think about, think about like aesthetics, beauty, you know, I mean, like if I were talking to maybe like a reformed person from the 1800s, it'd be like, that's like the, that's like the biggest waste of time, you know, but, but like, uh, but, but this small little book written by this Harvard professor who I'm not even sure is a believer uh, named Elaine Scarry called On Beauty and Being Just. And she talks about this. She actually talks about beauty having a reference point, you know, um, that when beauty is too self-referential, it's actually not that beautiful anymore. You know, um, when beauty is really beautiful, uh, it has a reference point and that reference point points beyond it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When you're looking at something, it makes you think of something else, which makes you think of something else, which makes you think of something else. When the thing that it makes you think of is itself for itself's sake or the creator for the creator's sake. And guys, I mean, like, we've probably heard hundreds of songs from all sorts of people. And sometimes the work of creativity is getting out of our own way, right? I mean, like when we're writing, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're like being open to, and so in that way, I understand this like response thing, you know, we want to be deeply authentic, but at the same time, we don't want it to be so self-referential that that's all that a person gets out of it. And so she's saying that true beauty, you know, calls to us from beyond, from, from the beyond, because it has a, it it has almost like an infinite reference point, you know? Um, And she's just saying this as a person who I don't think is a Christian because Guys, I mean, like, as you're saying, John Mark, nobody thinks that the the idea that the eminent or the the material is all that there is is good news. Nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks that. I mean, the world is dying to this kind of idea that everything just material is real. And this is actually why, which is not to make too much politicization about this, but this is actually why I think we're trying to figure out new ways of doing public theology, because I think that. Uh, there is a there is a certain kind of mindset that presupposes, uh, say, within whatever Christian right or left arm there might be, that the halls of power are actually neutral, and we can wield them on our behalf if we embed them with transcendent transcendence. Whereas all the post secular guys say, "Are right, no, no, no." There's transcendence everywhere, including in those halls of power, and so they're not neutral. They're actually apostate. You know, <laughs> so so like everybody is actually giving up the ghost on this kind of idea that the material is all there is. And that's why Stranger Things is so popular. And that's why, like, people read fantasy and science fiction. And that's why people's imaginations are being expanded and blown out. I think we're in a moment right now, guys. Mm. Like, where if the right songs actually come, they will be where for wayfarers to the North Star that is Jesus Christ. John Mark, you know, just jumping yeah. off of everything that Ted is saying there. I, I'm wondering if you could just tell a story, if if it's not too personal. Uh, sure. You called me last week, and you were shaken, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty messed up. You were shaken because you, you re-experienced one of your songs that you wrote five years ago. Will you just tell everybody this story? Because it kind of perfectly exemplifies exactly what Ted is talking about right here. Yeah, so what Ted is talking about right here, and it's, it's the thing Ted and I have texted about, and I like to... I, I think he is a lot more articulate on this subject than I am, but I'm obsessed with it. Is I'm calling it uh, re-enchantment, right? That's what Ted is kind of talking about, I think, is the re-enchanting of the world, right? Is is filling the balloon of the known again with the air of the unknown, right? That's um, right. And That's so great I, way of saying it. I'm obsessed with this. I'm obsessed with it for a number of reasons, like, and if I'm going to give a little bit of history, like I was a worship leader early on in my life and I became pretty successful early on with worship music. And for whatever reason, I decided that worship music didn't have to be, you know, the, what we call congregational worship music. And I, I went off in another direction and I really enjoyed that direction, you know, but I always tapped back into that worship thing. And I considered what I was doing to be worship music. Right. But I developed. I had this whole world that was built around um, God. And I mean, like, God actually, the ideas of God, and then, like, who I was based on 
who I thought God was. Let me explain. So like, I'm a worship leader. So number one, like my income is coming from being a person that people look to for answers about faith. Right. Then, um, on top of that, um, I am, uh, becoming well known and my identity is tied up in being a person who was a believer. And then on, then beyond that, like I've been obsessed with God since I was very little, very, very little. Right. And so this is in every way who I am, like practically, spiritually, and then even, um, you know, as far as like who I, who I, uh, the way I think of myself, right? Like how I relate to other people or who people see me. What am I trying to say here? My platform, my identity, my significance, right? Significance is the word I'm looking for. So my significance is wrapped up in this. And then I kind of wake up one day and I'm like, I don't know if I believe in God. And so number one, all my hobbies are gone. My identity is gone. Uh, my income may be gone. <laughs> and then just my love for life is totally gone. And so I, I, I had this really difficult year, you know, where I struggled and grappled with all this stuff. And I realized one day, like, I liked my faith. I liked it. I didn't leave faith willingly. And I began looking for a way back into faith, right? During that year, you know, I joke about being an atheist for a year or at least a few months, you know, but I, I was still obsessed with God when I was an atheist. So I don't know if that counts, right? I still, it's still the thing I thought about the most. I actually thought about God more those three months when I was an atheist than I probably do now, <laughs> you know, like I, mean, I think about God all the time, but so I, I write this album and there's a bunch of songs that are clearly about me struggling with my faith. And I feel like I come to a conclusion that I'm proud of. And, but there's this one song I've always loved on the album. I've had the most difficult time explaining to people. It was the song Unhaunted. And we like to play it. And it's a fun song. But I'm even mumbling some of the words. And some of the words, I'm like, I kind of understand it. But so here I am, like, I've come back to faith through the most amazing um, you know, through the most amazing way, like reenchantment has been my window back into faith, you know, and I'm like, um, I could talk about that for a long time, you know, but, but reenchantment became my way back into faith, my permission to believe again. And so I've been obsessed with it the last year. And even before I knew I had the term reenchantment, I was obsessed with this idea. And, um, and so I'm even writing about it. I'm posting it. I'm trying to annoy people with it. I'm trying to make the term really, really popular in the, in the world. I'm trying to overwhelm people. Just put the language out there. And, uh, you know, and I have a couple other friends. We have these conversations all the time, but I'm obsessed. Like, I feel like my part of my ministry in life is to offer this language of reenchantment and give people permission to believe again. And I'm kind of having a bad day last week. I'll be honest, it's been, you know, a difficult, it's been a hard time for everyone. COVID, um, finances, and no one knows what their future is going to be. I don't know how to plan next year. You know, I moved all my tour dates and I hope that they work, but there's no guarantee. So anyway, I'm just halfway depressed and I'm sitting around and I don't know why. I think I was playing someone else's music and I had my Spotify um, set to where it will automatically play something else like that song. And I was listening to, I was looking for some encouragement. I was playing music by a friend of mine named Josh Carroll's. It's really making me feel good. And then I guess because Josh and I have toured together or we're friends, or so when someone listens to both of us, my song was the song that got recommended, right? And so I'm sitting there and the song Unhaunted comes on and I hear the lyrics like it's the first time, right? Mm. I hear, the, and I'm so clearly, when I heard the song, I, I fell over. I literally fell over because the song Unhaunted, if I could write a song right now about reenchantment, it would be that song that I wrote five years ago that I didn't know what I was writing and that I didn't understand. But it is so clearly a song for me right now. And I had no idea that's what I was writing five years ago when I struggled to put that song out. And I almost struggled to release it. Only reason I think I released it is because it's, I thought it sounded so cool, but I didn't understand it at the time. And I was like, there's no way people are going to understand it because I don't. 
And and uh, and then here it is five years later, and I can tell you what every line means. Every line is so perfect for where I am right now in the world. I don't understand that, guys. I don't know how that happens. Yeah. I, I love that story because it kind of encapsulates everything else we've been talking about. It, it's almost as though you wrote yourself a letter, a message in a bottle, and you threw it out into the ocean. And then, you know, five years later, you end up on this desert island and it returns to you. Man. Well, even when I thought I was off my rocker, I thought I was losing my mind, and I wrote that song, it was like God saying, like, nah, nah. <laughs> This is all part of the story, bro. This is all part of the narrative. And looking back on that season of my life, there have been times I thought, was that a waste? Was that a waste of a year? Yeah. And the whole time, you know, it was like the, it it was the, it was the, gosh, I don't know what to say without sounding super religious, (laughs) you know, but it was like God's plan. (laughs) I don't think that's religious. He was there the whole time. He was working the whole time. Like, I don't know why you're freaking out, bro. You know, because he was in it the whole time. It's so incredible to me. Mm. That's beautiful. Thanks for telling that story. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I don't think we're going to do better than that, boys. I think, I think we'll hang it. I think we'll hang it on that story right there. All right, everybody. You've been listening to the Ferment Podcast. These are my friends, Ted Kim from Chicago. JMM, Charlotte, North Carolina. Peace. This is Melissa Keller, Events Director for Vineyard Worship. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I've got a couple of ways you could really help us. First of all, review the podcast on iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also, connect with us on social media, Instagram at The Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.